Hey guys, welcome back. Well, this is the third part of this series. Now that I've had a good six, seven days of imaging with the EQ6R and using Green Swamp Server, I just wanted to go back and take a look at the performance of the mount right out of the box, how Green Swamp Server worked, and while we're there, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the images I got during this imaging session. I had a surprisingly cooperative period of weather here to collect data on these three targets, the flying bat, the lobster claw, and the heart, and uh, collected also some RGB data. The weather gods allowed me one extra day, so I went ahead and got some one hour on each of the RG and B filters for each of the three targets. And so this is my first time of getting some data to support replacing the SHO stars or the narrowband stars with uh, actual RGB stars. The equipment I'm using is listed on the right. I won't go through the whole list. The two new pieces, as I mentioned, are the Skywatcher EQ6R mount and the Green Swamp server serving as the interface between the mount and the other pieces of software that I have to work with. Got a pretty good balanced data set across these three targets over these seven days of imaging. I did all this on on the looking to the west they started i started up near the meridian and worked down picked up another target uh, the second target uh, back up closer to the meridian worked it down and finally picked up the heart nebula and worked it down to close to the horizon about maybe uh, 20 degrees off the horizon now one of the things that i did want to check out because it is a departure from my experience with the sea gym mount and the green swamp server manual it clearly states that if you're guiding with phd2 you need to check the uh, the box that says uh, tells phd to reverse the deck commands when you're on the opposite side of the meridian. So I wanted to check that out because it seems to me if you're using an ASCOM mount, ASCOM and PhD are talking to each other and they know which side of the meridian you're on. So I wondered if this was really required. So I did a little test on the last night and found out that, yeah, it's required. Uh, what's happening here, you're seeing the deck command. The deck is drifting off. The uh, PhD2 gives it a command, but because the check mark isn't uh, checked to flip the command, it's actually feeding the error, which creates a larger error, a larger command to correct the error, which in turn creates an even larger error and a larger. So that just that cycle continues. So the mount becomes unstable. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely, totally confirm that. And when you're using Green Swamp Server, check this box here and then calibrate whichever side of the meridian you want. And then when you go, if you go to the other side, of the meridian the guiding will still be good yeah if you're using green swamp server definitely check mark that box take a step back and look at all of the image defects and this is not an exhaustive summary by any means certainly there are some mechanical or setup things we can do to uh, encourage good images watch out for cable snags for long exposures if you have a guide scope there's flexure polar alignment can be an issue again for long exposures on the optical side clearly we understand focus field flatness spherical aberration those issues but on guiding this is the one area where the eq6r can put an oar in the water and help us out there are several aspects of guiding though seeing is one of those things that you just take it as it comes you're not going to make it better but you can make it worse depending on the parameter you're using in your phd2 settings uh, the mount gears this is something i contended with quite a bit with the C gym and found that the PhD2 algorithm, the predictive PEC algorithm, did help me to reduce the errors there, as did using a very short exposure, as long as it didn't cause me to chase the seeing. So there are some things you can do within PhD2 to uh, control some of these other things associated with the mount in particular. And then finally, maybe as a last resort, uh, you would actually take the mount apart and do some tuning on the internals. And I know a lot of people have done that, have tutorials out on that, and have seen some success from that. I'm not going to do that as long as the mount is behaving adequately and I'm not going to do it as long as the mount is still in warranty. What you're looking at here is the overall RMS pointing error broken down and calculated based on 400 second long sub exposure. So in other words, every image I took, there was a corresponding RMS pointing error that I could extract from going back into the PhD2 guide logs. There's such a thing as knowing what's good enough. If your image is good enough, there's no need to worry about this kind of stuff. So you look at your image, as long as you can rule out these other factors over here and you think guiding is a is a potential player, uh, is it good enough? And if it's not, then yes, there's something to be learned by studying the guide logs, by uh, maybe playing around with PhD2 parameters to a certain extent, uh, possibly tuning them out. But um, 
if you're getting a great image with, say, on average 0.6 arc seconds RMS of error, uh, your images are probably not going to get better if you were to spend a lot of time trying to improve that guiding. Guiding, it's less sensitive to short focal lengths. So you're typically only worried about this if you have a long focal length system and you're trying to, to get that guiding error down. There is a point of diminishing returns. If once you achieve good enough guiding so that it's not affecting your images, then there's no point in having better guiding than that. There's no point in wasting your time trying to improve it. I want to take this data that we see here and look at it in a from a different perspective. And this is that same data, but now put in the form of a histogram. The histogram is very similar to what you're already used to in an image histogram, where the, the peak is associated with a number of pixels that have a specific brightness, and the brightness ranges from total black uh, to saturated on the right-hand side. So we're used to seeing a graph like this. This is that same graph, except now the horizontal axis is the pointing error in arc seconds RMS. I could have some great guiding performance over here on the left tail of this distribution and that's okay it, it's a it's a bonus but it doesn't really improve my image what I have found in the past in using my long focal length system I was happy enough with 0.8 arc seconds RMS with my CGEM and the C925 and so if I could get this performance that I got over these past seven days then I am not going to complain one bit this is exactly what I want I never made this plot with my CGEM but if I did I suspect the peak of this would be back over here at around 0.75 at best and I might leak down into the 0.5 on the low end I'm uh, very happy with the uh, results that I've been getting over the past seven days. I've got to take them out, out, set it up, and maybe bring it in when bad weather approaches. And that's always been a bit of a hassle with the sea gym. One option is that I could leave them out outside, maybe without the OTA, uh, and just put the cover over it and let it rain. Slightly concerned about moisture working its way into the electronics. If you're not concerned about that, then that's a perfectly safe thing to do. For me, tearing down the mount means removing the OTA and the counterweights. Uh, the C gem was about 60 pounds. The EQR6 comes in about 56, so it's very comparable. However, the one thing I have found to be extremely helpful is this handle uh, on the back of the mount here. If I remove the OTA and the counterweights, I can just put one hand under the tripod and the other hand lift up and stabilize the mount and then just carry the mount inside. It's not the most welcome addition to home decor, uh, I will say that. And who knows, I might even try it by leaving the counterweights on. By and large, I have found the presence of that handle to be brilliant addition to the mount. We'll start off with the Heart Nebula. I'm not going to go through all of these and I'm not going to press all the buttons. I just kind of want to go through my workflow a little bit and show you some of the data and its progression as I did the processing. This is the sulfur data for the heart nebula. Here's the uh, HA data, and yeah, there's some oxygen data as well up in the fish head and in the center of the heart in particular. What I have done in the past is do some linear noise reduction of each of these images before I combine them into a color image. I didn't do that this time. I have found that it was some images I end up with kind of a splotchy color uh, in the combined color image. So instead, I just waited and did the linear noise reduction after I combined these data into the SHO palette. Got this as a result. Now the stars have a bit of a green or yellow cast to them. Now one of the things that I've been doing lately, and it's not correct, but it has a good effect, I've been using the photometric color calibration. Now photometric color calibration takes the colors you have in your stars and it compares it to the knowing what those stars are after plate solving the image it knows what the stars are it knows what their color spectrum is and it tries to adjust the colors in your rbg channels so that the stars match now this is a great thing to do if you're taking a picture of a galaxy you're imaging in rgb here we're imaging in narrow band false color so it's not strictly appropriate to use the photometric color calibration but it has a nice effect because the stars have a bit more green to them because that's where the HA is and they have a bit less blue to them because that's where the oxygen 3 is and so what happens is it tends to brings up the blue and reduces the green so that you can maybe you can see but there's a bit more cyan in this image now that I've done a photometric color calibration and the stars have transitioned from a 
green cast to more of a, a whitish yellowish cast over here now in this particular case i also acquired some data in the rgb stars and we'll take a look at those but it's at this stage that i would then go in and do some linear noise reduction on this image then take it up into the nonlinear range where we have the after i use the starnet plus plus pulling out the sho stars over here and the image uh, with the starless image over here so this is kind of my starting point for doing the uh, the processing but let's take a look at the rgb stars now these are the rgb stars that i got from one hour each on the rgb channels and i'm just going to zoom in maybe go down to some arbitrary place like right here and then let's look at the comparison of those same stars that are pulled out after photometric color calibration so photometric color calibration has taken the crap we gave it in the rgb channels and tried to make rgb stars out of them and this is the best it could do it's not bad but it's certainly they're certainly not rgb stars uh, any star that is more blue kind of loses out uh, when you give it sho data for the rgb channels and you can see these two big bluish stars here are not coming through as blue here they are a muted uh, yellow now some stars like this red star down here is a bit redder over here so there is, it did photometric color calibration did do a decent job with the stars but i'm actually quite pleased with the uh, effect of capturing just a little bit of data with the rgb stars and so when i go in to combine the image in the final image, I'll be using these stars instead of these stars, and I'll have a more realistic looking set of stars. Now, I also did the photometric color calibration using this star. So giving the photometric color calibration routine actual RGB data, it did a very good job of adjusting the red, the green, and the blue levels to achieve the best match of these star colors with the actual known star colors. Well, this is kind of the starting point of the processing there are several ways to go about this one you can make a hue change to try to shift colors from the green into the more gold and cyan colors in this case i think i worked exclusively with dealing with color masks playing with those masks to alter the colors and this is what i finally got after playing around with just the the colors it's at this stage i'm going to pull out the luminance from this image so if i pull out the luminance this is what I end up with and it's after I pull out the luminance that I go back in and do a TGV denoise of this color trying to reduce some of the chromatic color noise that's in here but not doing anything else from a detail perspective it's just a color so I can be fairly aggressive with the noise reduction and with TGV denoise and this image because it's over here with this luminance image that I'm going to be adjusting and trying to pull out more of the detail and do a little bit of noise reduction what I've been doing lately is using the HDR wavelet I play with different scales and see which one gives me the best effect. And so now what we want to do is to combine this uh, detail enhanced version of the luminance. We want to combine it with this image to bring the detail from here over into here. This is what it leaves me with. And now, of course, we're at the point where we can combine this star field with this starless image to get the final image. And one of the things that I found, we've all found when we have these wide field views is these stars kind of jump out at you and uh, distract you from the nebulosity that you're actually interested in. And so one of the things that we'll do is cut down the star strength. What I tend to do is use the uh, curves transformation to drag down the stars a bit so that the brighter stars stay bright. There's only a few of them, relatively speaking, but the really faint and numerous stars are brought down more, much more dramatically rather than by simply applying a linear vector. I find that seems to work a little better. And let's go over to the final image. I've rotated it so that it looks like a heart. And I'm actually pretty pleased with the coloring and the detail here. This is a, a very good target. It has lots of good detail in the core of the, the nebula. You can see lots of interesting cloud structure and uh, the colors are, are amazing there's some good oxygen here available for pulling out that cyan but it's actually a, a it turned out to be a very nice image and it's a good uh, target to to try if you haven't tried this target already i also did the same kind of processing with the uh, lobster claw and this is what i get here the bubble we have the bubble nebula down here we've got that protostar target up here an open cluster down here and of course the uh, lobster claw itself 
in this area. Once again, I'm playing mostly with the color mask to transition from the mostly green SHO image into this uh, this scheme with uh, the blues and the golds and the yellows, and, and I think that works out well. So I think there's some nice detail in here as well as down here in the uh, bubble nebula. This is, the bubble nebula is one of those targets that I've been wanting to go after with my C925 just because it's a it can really zoom in on uh, the detail in this in the bubble nebula area. I've got a bit more green here. Probably could stand to cut back on the green. Pretty pleased with that result and the framing. I think there's lots of interesting targets in here that are uh, that are worthy of being a target on their in their own right. For example, the ED102 could might match up well with this lobster claw itself. The uh, cement cassegrain might match up well with the bubble nebula and so on. So there's some it's a good reason to go back and revisit this target using a different telescope. And then finally, my uh, least favorite target in the world. And I think I'm, I've just about had enough of this target. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have had the same experience, but do you have targets that you don't just, they, it seems like a good idea, but then you try to do it and it just like, uh, it just kicks sand in your face and ties your shoelaces together. I have a number of issues with, with this target, not the least of which is the faint O3 signal. Also, my filters tend to flare up more on this target, I think, than any other target I have. And so that creates a, a processing challenge as well. And then finally, the, the cloud detail, the nebulosity detail, it has none of the features that you can see and the structure, the smaller scale structure that you see here in the Heart Nebula, you don't get any of that in this, uh, the bat, the flying bat nebula. It's almost a very unsatisfactory target. No metal print for you. Green Swamp Server says it tells you quite clearly to do the check mark to tell PhD to reverse the deck commands on the other side of the meridian. Absolutely, you need to do that. I'm not sure why that's the case, but uh, you definitely need to do that. So be sure you, you take care of that if you're going down the path with the Green Swamp server. I need to investigate on how to set uh, the RA and deck limits on the mount. The Green Swamp server has the capacity to set limits, but the limits are only warning limits. They don't actually stop the mount from moving once they get to the limit. They just change the color of a warning light. So you obviously you got to be awake and observing your computer screen in order to to make sense of that if something is going past a limit then i kind of want the system to stop and maybe there's a way to enter those in and have the results stored in the sin scan hand controller or even maybe with nina's new advanced sequencer there's a way to put in some limits the handle on the back of the uq6 are surprisingly a brilliant feature uh now i can just pick the whole mount up and bring it inside and take it right back outside the guiding performance has been from my perspective it's been outstanding i would be perfectly happy with this guiding if i could maintain this with my heavier scopes this is excellent no reason to certainly no reason to open the mount up and tinker with it maybe a few adjustments here and there i can do to to improve a few things but uh, i am absolutely pleased with the guiding performance on the image processing side if you're not using photometric color about calibration for sho images you might give it a shot it's it's certainly not intended for false color images but there is a nice little side effect in that it does kind of beat down the green and brings up the blue a little bit one of the things that i did for the first time here here is to replace the SHO stars with the RGB stars and the nice thing about collecting data just for RGB stars is you don't have to waste too much time processing the image you're, you're only interested in the brightest parts of the image so there's no need to play with darks or flats or do a dynamic background extraction you just want the bright stars the rgb stars make a nice addition to the picture using green swamp server along with the skywatcher eq6r i have no complaints i think it, things uh, worked out very well there's a couple of questions i have but by and large this was very successful i think it certainly helped to do a lot of the uh, connectivity and functional testing indoors before I went out for my first imaging session. It's always a bit more challenging when you go outside for the first time in the dark to do some things. So I certainly encourage you to put new equipment together to the extent that you can and test it indoors. And then when you go outside, at least some of those uh, early gotchas will be already taken care of. By and large, this is a, a very successful experience with the EQ6R and I'm looking forward to more experiences with the EQ6R, starting with the ED-102 that I'll be transitioning to. So for now, thanks for signing in, 
and listening up, and I'll talk to you later.